Martin for the opportunity to uh, share with you some of our, uh, my lab's new findings. And um, my lab is basically interested in this uh, recently discovered complex, which is a transcription pre-initiation complex that regulates uh, transcription of a specific class of uh, viral genes. Um, through uh, understanding this complex, we can actually inhibit production of uh, Epstein-Barr virus, which is uh, production of new virus particles of Epstein-Barr virus, which is, as you all know, is an oncogenic herpes virus. Uh, this actually, these findings are also applicable to another uh, herpes virus, which is Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus that has the same complex. So uh, keep that in mind as I'm presenting uh, the data and I'll show you some of these. Um, uh, uh, okay, I'll just use my, okay. So uh, as you all know, herpes viruses are three subfamilies of herpes viruses, alpha, beta, and gamma. And oncogenic herpes viruses fall into the uh, gamma herpes virus. So you have the uh, Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus, the KSHV, and the EBV. Um, like all herpes viruses, uh, they all have this latent state where uh, very few genes are expressed. And this is the dominant phase of the, or the predominant phase of the viral life cycle. But there's also this lytic phase that uh, we are trying to understand where the virus switches from this latent to the lytic phase. And during the latic phase, that's the phase where uh, most of the viral genes are expressed, uh, virus particles are assembled, and they're released to infect uh, 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 new cells and, 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 and new tissue. And um, in EBV, most of the, uh, or the, the EBV infects basically epithelial cells and, uh, and, uh, and B cells. Um, these herpes viruses are actually large compared to other viruses. So they're about 100, in EBV, it's about 172 kilo base pairs. And uh, almost 90% uh, of individuals or more than 90% of the human of the adult human population is infected with EBV. Um, so EBV is associated with several diseases. A uh, couple of these are uh, EBV is etiological agents, like uh, agent for these diseases, like infectious mononucleosis and uh, oral hairy leukoplakia. But it's also associated with um, with, with several uh, lymphomas and carcinomas, such as uh, Burkitt lymphoma, such as Burkitt lymphoma, uh, Hodgkin's disease, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, gastric carcinoma. Uh, PTLD and AIDS-associated lymphoma. Uh, some of these uh, lymphomas, such as Burkitt lymphoma and nasopharyngeal carcinoma, have this uh, interesting geographical distribution that we still uh, don't understand why exactly this is the case. Um, basically, my lab is interested in studying the lytic cycle, and uh, we strongly believe that the lytic cycle uh, is a major contributor to the um, to the development of cancers associated or malignancies associated with uh, EBV. And so um, uh, let me just present some, uh, you know, a couple of points that highlight why we are interested in the lytic cycle. Uh, for example, um, you'll see that lytic infection precedes development of EBV associated diseases. That's true in the case of Hodgkin's disease, in the case of, uh, uh, of Burkitt lymphoma, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, um, and definitely for PTLD. And in the case of MPC uh, or nasopharyngeal carcinoma and PTLD, you'll see that uh, we use high viral load and, uh, and um, elevated uh, antibody titers to, to, as, as predictive markers for the development of these uh, tumors. In terms of lab and research in a humanized mice, if you infect uh, a mice with a wild type uh, virus uh, versus a virus that uh, where you knock out the gene that, in, that, uh, that uh, encodes the protein responsible for transitioning the virus from the latent to the lytic state, you'll notice that uh, the knockout, uh, the gene with the knockout virus uh, actually has a significantly less B cell uh, lymphoma uh, development in these mice. So suggesting that um, the transition into the lytic state is important for uh, B cell uh, lymphoma development. And uh, we don't really understand why exactly the lytic cycle is important so far, but um, there are several uh, hints that we can uh, deduce. And one of these is that uh, if you uh, produce a lot of virus, the virus is likely to infect more cells, and that increases the possibility that. Uh, uh, the virus will, uh, one of these cells will uh, turn rogue and become neoplastic um, 
afterwards. The other possibility is that um, uh, these uh, in lytic infection or lytic genes, they encode, um, uh, they actually um, uh, um, induce expression or activation of uh, several uh, cytokines. Uh, and in addition, they also express uh, uh, cytokines. So in the case of EBV, for example, it, uh, EBV expresses uh, viral IL-10, which is an immunosuppressant. Uh, and the case of KHSV, it expresses viral IL-6. So uh, there are several um, uh, proteins or, or products of these lytic, these lytic products that could uh, uh, be potential for uh, um, tumor uh, progression and so forth. And so uh, we're really interested in understanding the lytic, uh, lytic infection. We're interested in understanding how the virus uh, uh, produces new virus particles. And if we can actually block that, then I think we have achieved something uh, interesting. So um, this is just a quick summary. And the point of, of, the, of the cascade of events that take place uh, during the uh, lytic cycle and um, uh, what th the reason I'm showing this is to show you um, is to talk about these uh, what we refer as uh, structural proteins. So um, uh, structural proteins are expressed in this particular stage of the um, of the viral life cycle. So um, the events that take place during lytic infection, you have these two transcription factors. One is called zebra, and the other one is called RTA. Uh, I have another pointer here. Nope, the same. Okay. So uh, two transcription factors, one is called zebra and the other, was, other one is called RTA. These two transcription factors activate transcription and expression of downstream genes, which we refer to as early genes. Uh, these early genes encode, mainly encode uh, proteins that are involved in, trans, in viral DNA replication. Uh, as a result, um, the, the, the virus replicates its genome and then um, you get the stage of late gene expression. This is the stage that uh, results in expression of these capsid proteins and glycoproteins, which is really essential for the virus to uh, progress and, and uh, produce new um, virus particles. And that's the stage we're really interested in. So, oops. What you can see here in this uh, diagram, basically, this is um, a herpes virus particle. And uh, this part here are, are these, all these capsid proteins that, are, uh, uh, that, that protect the DNA inside of it. So it's, it forms like a capsule with the DNA inside of it. And then uh, on the outside here are these glycoproteins. And the region between the capsid and um, the, the envelope here are, is this tegument area. Um, which uh, basically packs certain proteins that the virus, when it enters the cell, it unloads these proteins and it basically takes control over the cell. Most of these proteins that you're looking at here are uh, proteins encoded or, uh, during the late phase, or we refer to them as late genes. And this is the phase of the viral life cycle that we're really interested in because there's a lot of uh, research done on the early events that are happening, but there's very little research done on the late phase. So there's the mechanisms that regulate transcription of late genes is really not well understood. And that's the part that we're trying to understand. And so about um, maybe eight years ago, uh, I became interested in this protein. It's called BGL4. This protein is a viral protein kinase. And uh, it's important for the process. And we didn't know what, what the function of uh, this uh, viral protein kinase. But um, I did this experiment. And what you can see here is, um, let me just go through the, the gel itself. So if you provide an empty vector, which is a CMV here, denotes the promoter that we're using, uh, nothing happens. These are latent cells. So you don't get any uh, lytic activation. If you provide this protein called zebra, which is one of the transcription factors I showed you at the beginning, zebra activates the lytic cycle and it, it activates expression of BGL4, which is this protein kinase I'm talking about, and it activates expression of this protein called FR3. This is a late protein, it's part of the viral capsid. Um, 
if you knock down expression of BGL of four uh, using what I call here is siRNA for G4 or for BGL of four, you see that the BGL four protein is not as markedly expression of the BGL four protein is markedly reduced, and um, there was the the reduction here also results in significant reduction in the amount of protein of late protein, and this was basically the first indication that we've seen where we can uh, see an effect by knocking down one protein and you see an effect on late gene expression. Uh, we did this trick, which I, I'm gonna be using the rest of the talk, where we, uh, to, to demonstrate that the sRNA is really specific, we uh, mutate the uh, sequence in the uh, BGL4 uh, sequence on a plasmid so that we provide synonymous mutations and these mutations um, are not recognized, uh, disrupt the, uh, the capacity of the sRNA to recognize uh, the, the ectopically expressed BGL4. And now we can rescue um, the, the defect. We can provide this sRNA together with a resistant form of uh, BGL4 here and you restore expression of late genes. So from this, we concluded that uh, BGL4 is really important in the process of transcription or, or synthesis of late products, but that's only one product. So we did uh, an RNA-seq experiment and uh, used this siRNA that we developed and uh, looked at the whole viral genome. And uh, in this siRNA or in this figure, I've uh, labeled the uh, late genes in red. And you can see that most of the genes that were affected when you knock down BGL4 are actually uh, late genes. Except for these two um, uh, genes here, two transcripts here, which uh, were also affected. And these two transcripts, they belong to a, a gene called BGLF3 and another one called BGLF3.5. For the sake of time, 3.5 is not involved in uh, late gene expression, but uh, BGLF3 is involved in late gene expression. Let me show you the data. So again, if you provide zebra, this is an early gene. You don't, uh, you activate early genes and you activate FR3. If you knock down BGLF3, this other protein, um, you don't get late gene expression, but you get early gene expression. So at this point, um, there's a phase, a phase before viral DNA replication and including viral DNA replication, everything is happening except the late phase of, uh, of, of, the, of the lytic cycle. And again, to, to confirm that this is really, uh, uh, that these sRNA are specific, we use this sRNA resistant form of BGLF3 and you provide this uh, form of BGLF3 that cannot be degraded by the sRNA and you restore late gene expression one more time. So just to summarize, at this point, we have identified two proteins. Uh, these are virally encoded proteins. These were the first time to show that these proteins are regulators of late gene expression. Uh, one of these proteins is called BGLF3, and BGLF3 has no identifiable domains at all. Uh, the other protein is called BGLF4, which is a protein kinase, and uh, we were the first to show that uh, these two proteins are important in the process of the gene expression. Now, um, at the same time, several other groups have identified uh, other uh, late gene regulators. And from this slide, I just want to uh, quickly uh, give you an update of, you know, uh, what we know about the process of late gene expression or this complex and uh, our re new finding, which I won't have time to go through all of them. So uh, the first protein that binds to late promoters, so late promoters has this unique structure. It has this TATT um, uh, sequence. So your regular data box is a TATA. This is, these have TATT, these are predominant in late genes. Uh, the TATT sequence was actually identified here in, at Yale by uh, George Miller's lab and uh, by a student called uh, Tricia Serio. And uh, many years later, um, a French group identified this protein that binds to the TATT. So this, this is basically a TATA box-like uh, protein. Um, we found that uh, among all these proteins, so this is some of our new findings that BCR1 is the only protein that has the highest affinity to RNA polymerase II. So we believe that BCR1 recruits RNA polymerase II, but we also found that this protein called BGLF3 that we discovered uh, actually recruits, uh, when it interacts with BCR1, there's a lot more of RNA polymerase II that comes down. And then we found that uh, BGLF3 is phosphorylated and the phosphorylation is important 
uh, for recruitment of two other proteins in the complex, a protein called BFRF2 and another one called BVLF1. And uh, in our, the, the recruitment of these two proteins results in the recruitment of a third or another protein called BDLF3.5. These are all core immunoprecipitation experiments that uh, we've done. And then uh, this other protein, BDLF4, interacts with, uh, BG, uh, with BGLF3. Um, if you just look at this complex, you notice that BGLF3 is, is a hub protein or a scaffold protein. It basically organizes the interaction of all these other proteins. And um, one more protein that basically interacts with BGLF3 is the kinase, the BGLF4 kinase. And uh, we found that this kinase can actually uh, phosphorylate the C-terminal of RNA polymerase II. And we all know that the C-terminal of RNA polymerase II, um, phosphorylation of the C-terminal of RNA polymerase II is essential for the process of transcription. There are two kinases, CDK7 and CDK9, that uh, are involved in um, phosphorylation of uh, RNA polymerase II. And these kinases, inhibitors for these kinases, have been uh, uh, the subject of, uh, or the topic of several uh, uh, trials in, in, cancer, in cancer therapy. So um, the question now is, or the, 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 the interesting, these, these, these experiments are currently ongoing in the lab, but the interesting part is that if you have BGL4 expressed in the cell and you're trying to inhibit CDK9 or CDK7, uh, maybe BGL4 can actually substitute for the functions of these um, cyclin dependent kinases. And you know, at this point, you know, we don't know if these inhibitors would inhibit uh, BGL4 or not. So it's just uh, one of the interesting observations that we uh, currently have. So this is just a summary uh, for what I'm going to be, not I'm going to be, I'm not going to be talking about all of this because it's a lot, but um, we refer to this group of proteins as late gene regulators. And uh, I'm not talking about all these proteins. I'm only going to focus on uh, one uh, point, which is that BGLF3 is actually phosphorylated, and phosphorylation is important for recruitment of these two proteins. So we have a single phosphorylation site. If you abolish this single phosphorylation, uh, basically you abolish uh, uh, expression of late genes and production of new virus particle. So the question we have, does phosphorylation regulate senses of late gene products? And we started this project by doing uh, mass spec. We uh, purified BGL3 from EBV infected cells uh, in the uh, lytically infected cells. And then we did uh, phosphor enrichment followed by uh, mass spec. And we identified the threonine here, it's threonine uh, 42, as a uh, phosphorylated uh, residue. The experiment was done seven times, and in each of them, we identified uh, phosphorylation at threonine uh, 42. Uh, this residue is actually quite interesting because it's conserved in all herpes viruses. So you see here the threonine, and it's threonine 42 in all herpes viruses, and uh, particularly in this uh, another oncogenic herpes virus, Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus. So uh, we wanted to know what's the uh, importance of this uh, phosphorylation. And here I'm using, or, or we are using, um, two different cell lines, a Burkitt lymphoma cell line and a gastric carcinoma cell line. And if you, uh, these are naturally infected uh, cells. And if you, uh, you knock down the endogenous BGLF3, you see a reduction in this viral capsid protein, BFR3, but no effect on the early uh, genes. So it's specific to late genes. Uh, you, you can rescue the, the, or suppress the effect of the sRNA by providing this resistant uh, form of BGLF3, which is wild type form. But if you mutate the wild type from uh, the, to introduce the threonine 42A mutation, you see that there is a significant reduction in the amount of FR3E protein. Um, this is also true in, in these gastric carcinoma cells. Um, as I mentioned, this complex works in transcription. Uh, so it's a viral pre-initiation complex that uh, regulates transcription of late genes. And it's specific for late genes. So if you look at, at this early gene here, this is viral lytic uh, genes expressed at the early stage. Uh, you can change threonine 42 to alanine, but nothing happens. If you look at these uh, four late uh, transcripts, you're changing threonine 42A to alanine significantly reduces expression or transcription of these genes. So we've identified a single phosphorylation site that basically um, 
uh, abolishes, seems to abolish transcription of late uh, genes. We wanted to look at viral DNA replication. So as I mentioned, events that take place before DNA, before uh, uh, DNA replication are early events and to check whether all the early events are intact, we look at viral DNA replication. That's one of the ways we do it. And you can see that when you knock down uh, T42A, uh, basically, or you mutate T42A, nothing happens. But if you look at the amount of virus produced uh, when you change the threonine to 42, to uh, threonine 42 to alanine, you basically abolish production of new virus particles. So it's single phosphorylation site abolishes production of new virus particles. We wanted to know why. Why is this um, single phosphorylation important for uh, transcription of these genes? And, and mechanistically, what exactly is, 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 is happening? And the first thing we, we started doing was to, uh, the first thing we started doing was basically to uh, do these pairwise co-immunoprecipitation between BGLF3 the wild type and the mutant and ask, can they um, interact with, uh, with the other components of the complex? But all these pairwise co precipitation experiments did not work. And uh, we uh, basically came up with this idea, which I think is an interesting idea, with trying to rescue the defect in T42A by overexpressing uh, the other components of the complex and see whether the other components of the complex can actually shift the equilibrium to, uh, to, to uh, result in some kind of a uh, partial rescue of the T42A mutant. And so if you look at, the, at this experiment here, um, this is a T42A mutant. You don't get any, you, you hardly get any uh, viral capsid protein expressed, the BFR3 protein, but if you overexpress the other components of the complex, you start seeing uh, significant uh, uh, expression of, of, of late genes, suggesting that these components, additional components, can suppress the effect of the T42A mutant. So that was very interesting because we wanted to know which component uh, can, do, can, can basically rescue the defect. And we did all these experiments, but I'm uh, showing you uh, uh, some of them. So here in this experiment, we again, we expressed all the late, late gene regulators here, but now we started uh, excluding one at a time. And we noticed that if we exclude uh, BDL of four or BCR of one, nothing happens. But if you exclude these two proteins, BFR of two and BVL of one, you don't get the rescue. So we asked a question whether uh, can these two proteins by themselves um, restore expression of late genes? And if we, we provided different combinations of these uh, late gene regulators, uh, two at a time, and you can see that BFR2 and BVLF1 uh, are the only two proteins that we showed earlier are important, that are the only two proteins that are essential for uh, rescuing or suppressing the phenotype of T42A. So this suggested that maybe um, the phosphorylation basically interacts with, um, with these two proteins. And so we resorted back to co-amino precipitation, but at this point, we express a complex altogether of the three proteins together. And um, just to show you here, if you focus on these two lanes here, this is the wild type, number six, and number seven is the uh, mutant. And we're expressing the three proteins, BFR2, BGLF3, and BVLF1. And you'll see here in the wild type, when you pull down with BGLF3, you pull down BFR2, and you pull down BVLF1. But the mutant um, is defective. It interacts fine with BFR2, but it's defective in pulling down BVLF1. And this is uh, a dense geometry of these bands. And you can see, we believe that phosphorylation here is important for recruitment of BVLF1. If you mutate the site, um, the phosphorylation site, then you don't get BVLF1 to be part of the complex, or the BVLF1 cannot be recruited to this complex. So, in summary, um, we started basically by looking at, uh, we, we're interested in these uh, late genes, or these genes that encode uh, structure, viral structure proteins, the capsid proteins, the uh, glycoproteins, and these proteins are essential for um, uh, de novo infection and so forth, and uh, production of virus particle. 
And we identified two proteins. One is a kinase and another protein that we refer to as BGL3 that doesn't really, uh, we don't really have, understand the, 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 the function of this protein. There are no identifiable domains or anything like that. And so um, we started looking at BGL3, was a BGL3. We did a lot of co-amino precipitations, but we wanted to focus on BGL3. And we found that BGL3 is phosphorylated and that it's phosphorylated at a single site, 3 name 42 If you mutate this site to alanine, uh, you don't get any transcription of late genes. You don't get any production of this oncogenic herpes virus. This site is also conserved in KSHV. And uh, we did all these um, ectopic expression or complementation experiments to understand uh, the, 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 the dynamics or mechanism of uh, interaction between the uh, phosphorylated form of BGL3 and other components of the complex. And we found that, uh, that um, BGL3 basically interacts with these two proteins, BVLF, BVLF1 and BFRF2. And if you um, abolish phosphorylation, then BGL3 doesn't interact with these uh, two proteins. And so um, we have several um, future directions. One of these, um, and, and here are the directions. So T42 regulates the function of VPIC and other herpes virus. I showed you that KSHV has the exact same uh, residue. Is it phosphorylated or not? And is it important in uh, expression of these genes or not? Uh, the the uh, most important question, which kinase phosphorylates uh, BGLF3? Um, and other, other components of the complex, are they also phosphorylated? Are they modified somehow? Is there any, uh, are they ubiquitinated or anything like that? So that's something we're actually looking at. And then um, we understand that via DNA replication is important. Uh, so uh, I didn't really talk much about that, but we know that via DNA replication is essential for the process of late gene expression. And the question is, um, what is the link between viral DNA replication and uh, expression of late genes? And so uh, with that, I would like to um, thank the people who did the work, Jin Lin, Lee, and Ann Walsh in my lab and previous lab members. Definitely want to thank uh, George Miller for um, support um, and uh, other people here at Yale and uh, outside, and I'd like to thank, uh, to thank the American Cancer Society and the Yale Cancer Center for uh, support. Uh, I started this project with a pilot grant from the Yale Cancer Center, so I'm very grateful for that. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>